Do you love games of global domination? How about the third act of Return of the Jedi? If so, you're probably going to love Star Wars Risk. Star Wars Risk is a game for two or four players, which, like I said, takes place over the final scenes of Return of the Jedi. Spoiler alert, no Ewoks. Risk and Star Wars are two things that have been co-branded before. In this version, Star Wars, yeah, we get a lot of that, but Risk, mm, not so much. Let's take a look. Here's the board for Star Wars Risk, and as you can see, it's pretty cool. It's in the shape of a giant TIE fighter. And just like in Return of the Jedi, you have three battles going on simultaneously. Over here, you have the race to infiltrate the Imperial base and bring down the shield to the Death Star. Over here, Luke and Darth Vader battling to the death. And in the middle, we have the giant space battle, the Rebels attacking the Death Star, and of course, the Imperials trying to defend it. All the actions in this game are decided by these five dice and these two decks of cards here. You have the green Rebel deck and the red Imperial deck. And you can see all these different icons on here. All the actions are based on these symbols, these, this artwork. And as you can see, each card gives the players different options to use when they play it. So now let's take a look at each battle individually. Let's start out by taking a look at the Battle of Endor. This little token here represents the rebel forces on the moon. And their goal is to move up this path through Endor, hitting the story beats from the movie, until they get up to the shield generator and destroy it. Now you can see each one of those little circles there has a number assigned to it. When the rebel player plays their rebel symbol card, they get to roll five dice. And for each number they roll higher than the spot they need to move to, they get to move one spot. So of course at the beginning it's easy because all you got to do is roll two or higher. So you're going to be moving a lot, you move up the path. But as you move up, the numbers get higher and higher until you get up to the shield generator and you have to roll fives. Now the Imperials aren't completely defenseless here. Whenever they play their Imperial symbol card, what they can do is put down these little plus one markers and these markers actually represent stormtroopers that are going to block the Imperials so if you were to play this card what you could do is play down three of these in the next three open spaces so there's a plus one plus one plus one now instead of having to roll twos there the rebel player has to roll threes and all the way up so when you get up to the top it's going to get really tough because you're going to have to roll sixes to dis destroy that shield generator if there are stormtroopers in your way. Once the shield generator is down, the rebel players now have the opportunity to destroy the Death Star in the space battle, which we'll talk about in a minute. Over on this wing of the TIE Fighter, we have the battle between Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker that's taking place inside the Death Star. Now this is a pretty simple, straightforward fight. You see their hit points here, represented by their lightsabers. That's also their attacks, the red lightsaber and the green. When one attacks the other, they roll four dice, and anything that's four up is a hit. Now basically in this fight, they are battling to get bonus cards to play the next round. If Vader is able to kill Luke, take him down to zero hit points, then the Imperials will get four bonus cards the next round. If Luke kills Vader, he's only going to get three, but that's because he has a chance to do something else pretty cool on his turn. See these three spots on Vader's health here? The last three spots look kind of force lightning-y. If while well, Vader's health is in one of these three spots, the Rebel players manage to play this Darth Vader helmet card, then just like in the movie, Luke manages to redeem Vader, he, Vader kills the Empire, and they're both out of commission. If that happens, the Rebels will get five bonus cards next turn. And that is essentially how the fight between Luke and Vader is going to play out. And finally, in the center of it all, of course, you have the Death Star and the giant space battle going on around it. In this fight... The Imperials will be able to activate their TIE Fighters, the Star Destroyer, and the Death Star itself. Well, the Rebels will be using the Millennium Falcon and all the other ships in their fleet, including the X-Wings, the B-Wings, and the Y-Wings. Now, when you're fighting with these groups of little ships, you're basically going to roll one die for each ship in the space, and your success is going to depend on the ship you're attacking. The X-Wings, one is always destroyed on a roll of three or up. The Rebel ships, they are destroyed on different numbers. The fewer ships there are in the space, the harder they are to hit. So the X-Wings are the easiest to hit, while the B-Wings are the hardest. The fighters are all destroyed with one dice roll. They all basically have one hit point. Well, the Millennium Falcon and the Star Destroyer both have hit points on this side of the board over here. There's the Falcon and there's the Star Destroyer. Of course, the, both those ships can attack as well. 
The Falcon is only going to roll 2d6, while the Star Destroyer is going to roll 4d6 on their attacks. The Imperials can also activate the Death Star itself. And basically, when the Death Star attacks, the Imperial player will roll two dice. If either of those dice are a six, then it destroys one of these capital ships down here that the Death Star is attacking. Once all of these have been wiped out, the Death Star can start attacking spaces on the board here and wipe out all the sp ships in that space with one hit. Also, the Star Destroyer over there can spawn new ships on its turn, new TIE Fighters. So the TIE Fighters can regenerate, basically, Well, the Rebel side can't. All the ships you see on the board, the ships they start with, that's all they have. Once they're gone, they're gone. Once the Rebels on Endor have taken down the Imperial Shield, the Death Star is now vulnerable and can be attacked. Any ships, Rebel ships that are adjacent to the Death Star at that point can roll their normal attack, and all they're going to do is get 1-6, and the Death Star is destroyed. So the Rebels win by destroying the Death Star, and the Imperials win by taking out the entire Rebel fleet before they're able to make that happen. And that's how you play Star Wars Risk. I really enjoyed my time playing Star Wars Risk. I think it does a great job of encapsulating the Star Wars theme, especially Return of the Jedi, in a light, family weight, quick game experience. And I'm really glad that they decided to use iconography on the cards instead of words, because that way younger kids can play and not be at too big of a disadvantage. Once they get the hang of what the symbols mean, they're going to be able to keep up with the adults they're playing with. A couple cons about the game. I don't think it's too incredibly well balanced. The Imperials are going to have a really rough time winning this game no matter what. And what it boils down to is that it's just too easy for the Rebels to move up that track on Endor and destroy the shield before the Imperials have a chance to really set up and defend the Death Star in the space battle. On the other side of the board, I just don't feel like the Luke and Vader fight has the weight and the importance that it should. Those extra cards are nice, but a lot of times they end up being just a luxury, especially if you're playing the Imperial side and you're struggling just to keep up in the space battle and on Endor. So every once in a while you may throw a card over there just to try and keep up in the fight and prevent the other guy from getting the cards, but there's just not a whole lot of importance. It's not as important as what's going on in the other two fights, and you really feel like it should be. That's the one place where the theme is a little bit weak. But other than that, it's a fun game. Like I said, it's family weight. I play with my younger son. We have a good time. And it's quick enough and it's light enough that you can still have a lot of fun with it. Now, I did an unboxing video for this game recently, so I won't focus too much on, my, on the components. You can go watch that video if you want to get my in-depth thoughts on that. But I do want to talk about the fact that there is a special edition, deluxe edition of this game called Star Wars Risk Black, I believe. You get a few extra bells and whistles. You get a 3D Millennium Falcon, Star Destroyer, and uh, Death Star among some other things, just the higher quality components. Personally, I don't think that's necessary because, like I said, it's a lighter game and I just don't feel you need that extra step up in component quality. Uh, it's not a knock against the game, it's just if I want to pay extra for a collector's edition, I want it to be a heavyweight game that we spend a lot of time at the table with. The only two really weak spots I think about the components on here are the flat cardboard Millennium Falcon and Star Destroyer, especially that Star Destroyer just looks pathetic. A couple of hacks on this one, which you can do, Micro Machines, uh, they make a Star Destroyer and a Millennium Falcon about the right size for this game. Sell them in two different packs that are about five bucks each. So for ten bucks American, you can get your hands on uh, the ships that will definitely fit this game. Another thing you can do is what I do personally, I also own a copy of Star Wars Battleship. And if you take the Millennium Falcon and the Star Destroyer out of there, uh, they fit the game pretty well. And like I said... Uh, this, is the, this is what I use when I play, and it works just as well without having to spend all the extra money. So unless you're a collector and uh, you really want those upgrades, I'd say you're fine sticking with this, uh, this version of the game. Like I said at the beginning, not a whole lot of risk here. I'm not sure why they use that name other than for the branding. Uh, other than a few of the mechanics inside the space battle, you really don't get a sense that this is risk at all. If it does feel familiar, it's because this is a downgraded... Uh, not downgrade, that's a bad phrase, but a uh, smaller, more condensed version of Star Wars Queen's Gambit. It's essentially the same mechanics, it's the same system, uh, you play it out the same way. I was considering doing a head-to-head -head comparison between Star Wars Risk and Queen's Gambit, but because of the fact that you're going to pay about a tenth of the price for Risk that you will for Queen's Gambit, in my opinion, Star Wars Risk wins hands down. Queen's Gambit may be a little bit better of a game, but... 
you can't beat the price. Final analysis on this one, it's not a game that's without its flaws, but it is still fun for what it is. You're not going to get an in-depth Star Wars experience like you would with games like Imperial Assault or X-Wing. But if you're looking for a quick Star Wars fix, this is right up your alley. I don't think it's likely you're going to love this game, but there's a pretty good chance you're going to like it. If you think that might be the case, you're going to want to check out Star Wars Risk. Alright everybody, thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to go the extra mile, you can follow us on Twitter, like our Facebook page, and as always, be sure to visit our sponsor website, alterigogames.net. Going to get you tons of great prices on tons of great games. If you want to watch some of our older videos, find them on YouTube, Facebook, Board Game Geek, or the Alter Ego Game site. Until next time, guys, have fun out there.